So thank you for joining the HB 2871 OER Grant RFA webinar. We're pleased that you could take the time out of your busy schedules to join us and excited for the work that will be generated through this grant. We'll be recording this webinar and we should have a link posted by early next week for those that are unable to attend. And if you're joining by phone only and have questions, please submit your questions to Holly Oglesby by April 29th, which is tomorrow. For all other participants, please use the question box to type in your questions. We'll take a couple of short breaks during the webinar to answer questions and any questions we don't have a chance to get to, we'll compile answers and we send them out to participants. And in terms of the recording, uh, we'll send out more details about how that can be accessed. So okay, with that, um, today we have two presenters, Betsy Simpkins and myself, Teresa Wolf. I am the OER policy specialist that was hired as a result of House Bill 2871. It will be my task over the next year to help, help faculty and staff at our 24 institutions as they work to learn about, create, and adopt OER into their courses. And I'm Betsy Simpkins, and I'm a policy analyst here at the HEC, and I will be managing the grant program. So just a little bit about the HEC. For those of you that don't know what the HEC is, um, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission is both a, a commission and a state agency. The commission was created uh, as one of several agencies in 2013 out of the former Oregon University system that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, the goal of the HEC is to improve higher education for students across the state. The agency HEC supports the commission HEC and carries out legislative activity and research across seven, di seven different departments within the agency. So here's a, a little outline of what we're going to talk about today. We're not going to cover every, um, every point in the RFA, but we're going to try to cover some main, some main points for you. So to begin with, we're going to do a short overview of House Bill 2871. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the definition of OER and how it's used for the purposes of this program. Um, Teresa is going to talk a little bit about Creative Commons and licensing. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the RFA process and the application itself. So a little bit about House Bill 2871. It was enacted last year with great support from both the House and the Senate. Um, as an effort to try to address the high cost of higher education in Oregon. There are basically three main points to this bill. Uh, the bill itself requires that institutions prominently designate courses that exclusively use open or free textbooks or other low-cost or no-cost materials. It's important to note here that the institutions are required to post these designations even in the bookstores so that the students have enough information to be able to evaluate the true cost of a course. And this is true for all OER courses, not just those created as a result of this program. Uh, it's, uh, the bill also establishes the OER grant program that the RFA that this webinar is about uh, pertains to. And furthermore, it requires that the OER created as a result of this program should be the primary instructional material for a course and not just supplemental material like a lab manual, for example. Finally, House Bill 2871 create, created the OER specialist position that Teresa holds uh, as, an, as a way to help institutions uh, and assist in their OER research and development. So as Betsy has just mentioned, my function over the next year will be to assist the institutions with their OER research and development. So for purposes of this grant program, the definition of OER means a teaching, learning, and research resource which resides in the public domain, has an intellectual property license that permits free use and repurposing by others, and conforms to the American Disabilities Act of 1990. Many might immediately think of an electronic textbook, so one that's free as an example of OER, but OER could be many things. Content like images, videos, games, and even activities could be examples of OER if they have the license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. So for this particular grant program, the OER must be a resource that is used as the primary instructional material and is at low or no cost to the student. OER can be found in a variety of places, and there are many repositories out there from which you might access 
and find resources to use and repurpose. So we've listed a, a few here at the bottom of the screen, so things like Merlot and OpenStax, these are just some examples. We've also included a link to an interactive world map that contains repositories from many countries, and I think this is quite interesting because it gives a global perspective of Under House Bill 2871, OER grant program, the OER you develop must have and maintain a CC BY license. This is a Creative Commons license which allows for the free use and repurposing by others. And we have included a link here to the Creative Commons site, and we will be hosting a second webinar at a later date that discusses the different types of licenses and their use. So this will be an opportunity for you to become more familiar with the types of licensing and ask questions about their use. So this is just a list of the different types of licenses offered by Creative Commons. They have different uses, and the CC BY license up in, this, up in the upper left-hand corner is the most accommodating of all the types. So for the HB 2871 grant program, you'll need to use the CC BY license as is described in the grant RFA under Section 3.41, the project plan. Again, we'll have another webinar at a later date giving more information on these types of licenses and their use and how you might apply them to your work. So basically, the, in terms of the grant program, there are, there are a few main goals that we want to make sure that we highlight. The first goal is of the program, the grant program itself, is to encourage and assist colleges and universities in Oregon and their faculty to collaborate with each other and to create OER that can be adopted at any of the institutions. Obviously, the other goal is to provide funding to support the efforts to create the OER. And then ultimately, what we hope to do through this program is to raise awareness of the benefits and the availability of OER. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the application itself and the process. So for the most part, um, you need to be aware that you can only propose an OER for one of the 15 courses listed here. Now these are courses or series. As you see here, there's a chart with 15 courses or series. Uh, HEC analyzed data from all 24 public institutions and determined that these courses were the courses with the highest enrollment across all the institutions. So the course names and numbers that you see here are the most common among all of the institutions. So the OER that you wish to develop may have a different number or a name, and that's all right as long as you make sure that the course content is equivalent to what you see here on this chart. Um, uh, also, you'll note that if you propose to create an OER for a series, uh, like the bottom 10 there that you see, uh, the OER that you develop will need to be usable in all courses in that series. So in other words, you can't break up the series. Um, if you propose to develop an OER for a business, 211, 212, and 213 series, the, the OER needs to be usable in all three of those courses, not just the first one. So if you are interested in applying to, uh, to create an OER for a BA 211, just know that, you, that what you're proposing is for the whole series. You must also provide a project abstract, which is essentially just a project description um, of what you are intending to do with your OER. It's important to note here that we really are um, interested in you including a short description of how you intend to ensure that your OER will meet accessibility requirements that Teresa is going to talk about here in just a minute. Uh, you should also include a narrative of each of the seven sections that will be scored. And those are listed in the RFA and we'll talk about a little bit, a, a few of them here in a minute. You also need to provide a list of proposed activities that you anticipate uh, that you'll be doing it during the development of your OER. Some examples might be things like meetings or research of current OER or writing or editing content, of course. So as the intention of this program is that the OER be adopted, you should provide some kind of indication of when you would expect that OER to be adopted and implemented. Of course, a budget sheet will need to be provided and will likely correspond to your activity sheet, but some things that are not activities, such as compensating students or other faculty at other schools that are not really activities, but should be included in your budget sheet. Uh, and finally, we'd like to see an example of your OER designation for your catalog or registration. Uh, and like I said, you may already have, 
you should already have a, a standard OER designation if you have OER that you're currently employing at your school. But if you don't and you're going to develop one, we'd like to see the, either the logo or the language or however you intend to designate that OER. So in terms of who can apply, um, really any individual faculty member or staff member uh, or even entire departments at any of the 24 public institutions can apply. Um, we just ask that, in, that institutions coordinate together, uh, or I guess I should say that all the proposers at, at individual institutions should collaborate together uh, and submit just one application packet with all the proposals. So for example, Portland State might submit a packet, an application packet with multiple proposals, say for a Writing 121, as well as a Math 243-244 class. Um, in addition, we ask that the institutions uh, only submit one proposal per course um, so that basically you can any institution can apply for any or all of the 15 courses or series that we listed. But we ask uh, that if the institution, if you have multiple faculty members who would like to submit proposals for the same course, that the institution should be the one to decide which proposal to submit for our evaluation for that course. Um, all proposals should be submitted via email to Holly Oglesby, uh, who is the procurement officer, and you see her email listed there. And just to note that all the awards will be made directly to the institutions, not to individual faculty members, in one lump sum, and then the institutions will be responsible for dispersing the funds. So just a short review of the timeline that we're talking about here. Again, just a reminder, if you have any questions that we don't get to after this webinar, or if you have any additional questions that you come up with, um, please remember to submit those in writing to Holly by tomorrow, I think, 5 o'clock. Um, your proposals are due to the HEC um, by May 27th. And then uh, we'll be reviewing and evaluating those proposals between May 28th and June 9th. And then we'll make award notifications by June 10th. Uh, there will be progress reports required of awardees, um, but the exact number and timing of those reports will be determined later. And just a final reminder that your OER is expected to be developed by June 30th of 2017. So the applications will be scored on seven evaluation criterion. And I thought it might be helpful to discuss the top four evaluation criterion which have the highest points. So the first criterion that you see here is faculty engagement. Here you will describe a process by which your OER will undergo peer review and this might be that you organize, so for example, this might be that you organize a group of faculty from around your institution or you may decide to have a combination of faculty from your institution and from other institutions who are going to peer review the OER. This doesn't have to be faculty at just your institution, but it could be faculty from neighboring institutions or colleagues that you collaborate with. The second criterion is coordinating activities with other institutions. So for this category, you will identify your plan for collaboration and implementation across institutions. The focus here is the OER work, which of course could involve a variety of activities, is being done across institutions, not just among faculty at your home institution. The goal for the program is that the OER resources benefit the highest possible number of students in Oregon, therefore collaborate, collaborative work with others at other Oregon institutions would help achieve this goal. So as outlined in the section um, of the grant RFA, you are asked to outline which institutions you are working with and what, that, what those collaborations might look like. The third criterion is adaptation or use of existing OER. So HB 2871 outlines the use of existing OER, and this is a reflection of the fact that, of course, there are many OERs in existence, and there is significant time, cost, and effort on your part to create an OER from nothing. So we'd like to emphasize that there are many OER in existence. It's likely more effective, a more effective and efficient use of your time to repurpose and adapt an existing OER to suit your needs. While you're certainly welcome to create something new, if that's what you choose to do, the priority will be given to those who are adapting or making use of existing OER. And then lastly, the fourth criterion is meeting a need. In this criteria, the OER needs further development. The OER might need further development or additional resources to be a complete OER. 
So as an example, you may have an OER that you've been using but it's never undergone peer review, or that OER needs additional resources like a set of test bank or homework questions. In this example, you might be collaborating with another institution that needs this type of OER, and you work with them to develop the peer review and or the additional resources. And you would be submitting all of that together as, as, one, as one project. Both institutions and their students then benefit from the use of this OER. So for scoring, each proposal will be scored on a scale of 0 to 10 for each of the highest um, evaluation criteria. And I've just talked about the four criterion with the highest points, and the table below shows all seven with the total points possible for each one. The average score for each one will be converted to a multiplier as outlined in the RFA, and that will, that will then be applied to a maximum points possible for that criterion to achieve the final points. Okay, so I think we'll continue on here. So lastly, let's talk about Accessibility. OER must be accessible to all students. You'll want to ensure that your institution can provide required accommodations for students and the materials that you propose. Some examples of attributes of accessible materials include, but are not limited to, things like being operable, so for example, interactive user interfaces, being perceivable, having a screen reader and voiceover compatibility, being understandable, so things like captions, transcripts, or audio narr narrations for uh, multimedia, and lastly, probably most importantly, is robust, so something with longevity that, such that it has compati compatibility with current and future user tools. So while the proposals won't be scored on, on accessibility, just like your abstracts will not be scored, OER developed through this grant program must include an explanation of how the project intends to be compliant with all ADA and accessible, accessibility regulations, including the web content accessibility guidelines, and there's a section in the RFA 3.42 that discusses this. So we want to sort of emphasize here, you might not have all the details for this section in your final proposal, but we want you to indicate how you plan to address accessibility issues or give us an idea of what you're thinking about, and that your OER will have these elements developed in its final version. So we've listed a couple of resources here to help you get started. Certainly your institution's disability services office would be the first place you'd want to start with. Um, there's also more information to help ensure that your proposed OER will meet these accessibility standards. And in the included RFA, there was attachment E, which has an entire list of accessibility um, resources. So really just a couple quick reminders of the due dates and contact information. Again, written questions um, after this webinar should be submitted in writing to Holly by tomorrow. Your proposals due on May 27th, and keep in mind that the expectation is that the OER that you develop, the development period of your OER, should be completed by June 30, 2017. And below are the email addresses um, that are relevant. Uh, Holly Oglesby, again, the procurement officer, so questions and eventual submissions of, the, of your proposals will go to her. We also encourage you to direct any questions directly to her first, although uh, Teresa and I are more than happy to field, uh, to field questions and point you in the right direction as, as much as we can.